Let's turn back again tonight to the book of Daniel, chapter 6. And we'll pick up tonight at verse 19, Daniel chapter 6. Then the king rose very early in the morning and went in haste to the den of lions. And when he came to the den, he cried out with a lamenting voice to Daniel. The king spoke, saying to Daniel, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to deliver you from the lions? Then Daniel said to the king, O king, live forever. My God sent his angel and shut the lions' mouths so that they have not hurt me because I was found innocent before him. And also, O king, I have done no wrong before you. Now the king was exceedingly glad for him and commanded that they should take Daniel up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den and no injury whatever was found on him because he believed in his God. And the king gave the command, and they brought those men who had accused Daniel, and they cast them into the den of lions, them, their children, and their wives. And the lions overpowered them and broke all their bones in pieces before they ever came to the bottom of the den. Then King Darius wrote, To all peoples, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth, Peace be multiplied to you. I make a decree that in every dominion of my kingdom, men must tremble and fear before the God of Daniel, for he is the living God. And steadfast forever, his kingdom is the one which shall not be destroyed, and his dominion shall endure to the end. He delivers and rescues, and he works signs and wonders in heaven and on earth, who has delivered Daniel from the power of the lions. So, this Daniel prospered in the reign of Darius and in the reign of Cyrus the Persian. Let's pray together. Our Father, as we come before your word tonight, we implore you for your help. Please help us, Lord, and Give us understanding and cause your word to come to us accompanied by the power of your spirit, causing us to see your glory in your word, the glory of your son, and also to be encouraged in our own conflict, in our own Babylon, where you have placed us. We look to you for these things, asking them from you, knowing our father that you are not a father who is reluctant to give good gifts to his children. But you have taught us to trust in you and to believe that as we evil fathers give good things to our children, how much more will you give to us those good things that we need? So we ask these things, trusting in your fatherly care of us, and we ask them in Jesus' name. Amen. Now this evening, uh, we return to Uh, The sixth chapter of Daniel, one more time. Uh, Already we've considered how in this particular chapter, Daniel has rose uh, rose in the government of the new regime, the Medes and the Persians, and was about to be promoted by King Darius to the position of prime minister over the whole realm. And we considered the plot against Daniel in previous messages that was instigated by the governors and the princes who were jealous of Daniel. And we're also not quite thrilled about the idea of a man like Daniel with his integrity being in a position like this where he was over them because that would be the end of any theft and graft that they were profiting from. So in their hatred of Daniel, they determined to get rid of him. So they tried to dig up some dirt about him to disqualify him, as you remember, but that didn't work because they could find no fault in him. And they came to the conclusion that the only way that they could destroy Daniel was to fabricate some kind of conflict between the law of Daniel's God and the law of the land. They knew that there was only one price that Daniel would not pay 
to be loyal to the king, and that was to be disloyal to his God. So as you remember, they came up with a plan. They knew that Daniel was a man who never missed his devotional exercises each day. And so without revealing to the king their real motive, they proposed the making of a decree that no prayer was to be made for 30 days to any god or man save the king. The king being swept away by the flattery of the proposal which you may remember also included the the insinuation that all of the officials, including Daniel, were in favor of it. Well, he agreed to sign it into law. So the king issued the decree. And what did Daniel do when he found out about it? Well, as we read in verse 10, you'll remember in verse 10, Daniel just continued as as he had always done, as his custom was. He went into his upper room with his windows open toward Jerusalem. He knelt down on his knees three times that day and prayed and gave thanks before his God, as was his custom since his early days, preferring, if necessary, to suffer rather than to be unfaithful to God. Well, last time our focus was on verses 11 to 18. You remember these officials, they spied on Daniel. And then after they found him praying, they reported it to the king. And the king now suddenly realized what they were up to. The whole time. And he wasn't very happy about it. He tried real hard to undo it. But to do so would have resulted in a humiliating loss of face for the king. And it would have antagonized his officials and possibly jeopardized his throne as they made very clear to him. So he caved into his pride and his fear of man and he executed the decree. And Daniel was thrown into the lion's den. And this is where we left off last time. Daniel has been thrown into the lion's den. And we left Darius tossing and turning on his bed with a tormented conscience because of what he has done to his favorite civil servant. Well, now this evening, we come to what we might call the most exciting part of the chapter. Daniel's actual deliverance from the lion's den. And as I've reminded us a number of times, you you know, brothers and sisters, there's a sense in which Daniel's life, as is given to us in God's word, it serves as do the lives of all the men and women of the Bible. It serves as a, a type or a picture of the trials and triumphs of the true people of God throughout the ages down to this present day. Speaking of certain Old Testament events. The Apostle Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 10, 11, Now all these things happened to them as examples, and they were written for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the ages have come. James writes in James 5, 10, My brethren, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord as an example of suffering and patience. So as we study the life of Daniel. We've been doing that now for quite some time. We always need to keep before us that these are not merely interesting stories that are intended to entertain us or even merely to inform us of God's dealings in the past, uh, of history. They're not just histories, though they do give us history. It's interesting. I was listening on the ride down to Dan Carlin's Hardcore History. It's uh, it's a... um, podcast, but it's not some little dinky 10-minute podcast. It's like three to four-hour podcasts where Dan Carlin gives, he, he just talks about different periods in history in great detail and in, in, in a very entertaining way. And I was listening to his, his, uh, his podcast on Cyrus, all about the history leading up to Cyrus, all about the Assyrians and the Babylonians and, and uh, um uh, the Medes and the Persians and the Greeks and all of the really the, all of that's really the background of the book of Daniel. And from time to time, as he was reading different historians, Greek historians, Persian historians, quoting from them and kind of explaining some of the details of the various battles and so forth. From time to time, he would actually read from the Bible. Now, you can tell he didn't consider the Bible to be the inspired word of God, but he was looking at it as kind of a, another source of historical records. But he, but he would kind of mention, but you know, one of the problems we have with the Bible, it's always looking at things from a religious perspective. Well, the, the reality is that's the truth, isn't it? The Bible doesn't just give us history to give us history. It gives us history, and that history that it gives, it gives to us with a religious purpose. With a purpose 
to sanctify God's people, to teach God's people, to equip us to live in this world. And so this is not just history that's given to us, though it is history. It's history that's given to us by God for a purpose, right? It's given for our admonition and for our teaching and for our instruction. So, the dreadful day had come. Daniel has been thrown in with the lions. The king has gone home to a sleepless night. And now we pick up with verse 19, and as I seek to cover the rest of the chapter, notice first of all, as we first begin by just opening up the text and different parts of the text and making sure we understand what is happening here, notice first of all, the king's anxious inquiry concerning Daniel. Verse 19, Then the king arose very early. Now that word translated, that, that Aramaic word translated very early, literally means at dawn. And in the next words translated in the morning literally mean in brightness, in brightness. And the idea is that at the first break of dawn, just as the first beam of light was shining forth in the east, the king who was unable to sleep throughout the night rose up from his bed. And the text says that he went in haste to the den of lions. You can imagine him jumping up out of bed. As soon as, you know, the light comes through his window, he wakes up. Oh yeah, Daniel, he jumps out of bed. He runs to the lion's den to see what has happened. Hoping that just maybe Daniel's God had somehow intervened and delivered him. We see as we move to verse 20 that there was a measure of hope there, or at least what we might call a wish. Though at the same time, he had little actual confidence that God would deliver him as revealed in the manner in which he asked the question. Notice verse 20. And when he came to the den, he cried out with a lamenting voice to Daniel, literally with a sad voice. A voice of anguish. Apparently, he didn't wait for the stone to be removed. And it was probably still too dark at that moment to be able to look down into the den from the opening at the top. And to see inside the den clearly. So he cries with a voice of anguish, indicating that he, he wasn't really expecting uh, good news here. Yet there was a measure of hope, at least, that just maybe. As he cried, Daniel, servant of the living God. Has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to deliver you from the lions? And now moving from the king's anxious inquiry in verses 21 to 22, we have secondly Daniel's declaration of his deliverance. Verse 21, then said Daniel to the king, O king, live forever. I just try to imagine that scene. Try to imagine it. Here's, here's the king. He doesn't really have a lot of hope. He, in a sad, lamenting voice, Daniel, was your God able to deliver you? And all of a sudden, hey, I'm here, <laughs> right? I'm okay. Can you imagine? I mean, the, the, the king must have just almost jumped out of his skin when he heard Daniel's voice. Oh, king, live forever. Now, that, that, those words, were that was the proper, the common form of greeting for kings of that day. We see it. We see that, in fact, several times in this book of Daniel. But I find it interesting that Daniel addressed the king this way at this time. And here we have another example, I think, of the courteous, uh, respectful attitude that marked Daniel in his relationships with these heathen monarchs. Though Darius had been instrumental in Daniel being thrown to the lions in the first place, yet Daniel still responded to him uh, with appropriate decorum. And as throughout his life, Daniel shows himself to be a true gentleman. Though, of course, realizing that the king had done foolishly in making the decree and had behaved cowardly in not violating his own decree, yet apparently Daniel still cared about the man. And though not approving of his actions, he was sympathetic to his plight and predicament. So there's no rudeness in Daniel toward the king. There's no harshness in his voice, but he speaks respectfully as is always proper always proper when speaking to someone in authority. As someone has commented referring to the whole of Daniel's life, he never yields in devotion to principle, but he does not permit devotion to principle to serve as a cloak for rudeness. And we've been seeing that through this whole study, haven't we? Going all the way back to when he was a 14-year-old boy when it came to the king's diet. In the manner and 
courteous manner in which he refused to partake of the diet. So we don't have to be, there's a lesson here, we don't have to be obnoxious and rude to be faithful to God. I think some people seem to think the more obnoxious and rude you can be to people, the more faithful you are. But that's not true. While disapproving and even reproving the sins of the ungodly, we can still show kindness to them. O king, live forever. Then Daniel gives an account of what God has done for him. First of all, he declares that God has preserved his life by a miracle. Verse 22. My God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouth so that they have not hurt me. So God sent an angel to shut the lion's mouth. Now, there's a, there's, there's a lot we don't know about angels. So we have to be careful, I think, about saying more about them than the Bible strictly warrants. Sometimes people get into all kinds of conjectures about angels. And uh, there's even a kind of angelolatry, <laughs> I guess you could call it, that was popular uh, not too long ago. Uh, that I think is dangerous and is far removed from Scripture. But on the other hand, it's not like the angels are just a little small thing in the Bible. The Bible talks about angels quite a bit. We, we don't know a whole lot about them, but we do see them in the Bible a lot. The Bible does teach the existence of angels. It teaches us that angels are spirit beings created by God to do His bidding. And one area of service assigned to the angels is the care and protection of God's people. Psalm 34, 7, the angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him. I love that scene in, in the life of Elisha. Do you remember when Elisha and the, the Syrian king was trying to find him so he could kill him? And, and so he finds out what city Elisha's in and he comes to that city and he surrounds it with uh, you know, his armies and there's a threat that he's coming and everything. And his servant, Elisha's servants, all worked up and worried about it. Elisha's just kind of at ease, you know, and he says, Lord, open his eyes that he may see. And he walks out and he sees that the whole city is surrounded by the by a host of angels who are there protecting Elisha. He said, wow, that's amazing. It is amazing. But that's in the Bible, right? The Bible says, Psalm 91, 11, for he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. In Hebrews 1, 14, speaking of angels, we read, are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for those who will inherit salvation? But it's also possible, it's possible that this angel, this messenger, as the word means, was was that one who's referred to sometimes in the Old Testament as the angel of Jehovah. That one who, who, we have those instances in the Old Testament where we have that one who is referred to or called the angel of the Lord, yet at the same time, he is identified and worshipped as the Lord. A pre-incarnate manifestation of the second person of the Trinity, which seemed to be the case, you remember, with respect to the fourth man in the fire. Back in chapter 3, who at one point is referred to as the Son of God, another point is referred to as an angel. Well, the same may be true here. But at any rate, whether this was a pre-incarnate appearance of God the Son, or simply an angel in the normal sense of the term, the reality declared here is still the same. The Lord, whether in his own per person or by means of an angel, was with Daniel in the lion's den. The Lord was with him. And he shut the mouths of the lions so that they did him no harm. But not only does Daniel declare that God has preserved his life. Secondly, he declares that in doing so, God has pleaded his cause. Look at what he says beginning in the middle of verse 22. Because the Lord has done this because... I was found innocent before him, that is, before God. And also, O king, I have done no wrong before you. Daniel says, God closed the lion's mouth, at least partly, as a testimony to my innocence. To Daniel's innocence and his integrity, both as a servant of God and as a servant of the king. 
Now, the point in question is not absolute innocence in the sense of being sinless. Daniel's not claiming sinlessness. Just read his prayer in chapter 9. He definitely considered himself to be a sinner. He's not claiming sinlessness. But with respect to his general uprightness, with respect to his integrity and his innocence in this matter of his loyalty to the king before God, in God's presence, he was above just reproach. I was found innocent before him, he says. That is before, before God who knows the truth, who knows the heart. And God, knowing him to be what he professed to be, accordingly had sent his angel. But not only before God, he says, but also, O king, I have done no wrong before you. In my relationship to you, I have done nothing amiss. I've done nothing hurtful in violating the decree. There was no contempt toward you, no conspiracy toward your person, regardless of the false insinuations of your nobles that they have made about me. So the Lord has preserved Daniel's life, and in doing so, he has pleaded his cause, he has vindicated Daniel's character, and he has owned him as his true and loyal servant. Then we read in verse 23 that the king was exceedingly glad for him. Literally, the Aramaic says it was exceedingly good to him. It was something that made the king very glad, not only for Daniel, but also it was good to him. Now he had his trusted governor back. His guilt feelings were eased for what he had done. The trickery of his nobles had failed. And he commanded that they should take Daniel up out of the den. And then we have a summary statement of it all. So Daniel was taken up out of the den and no injury whatever was found on him because he believed in his God. Now I want to pause here before we go on. Why was Daniel delivered? Now, how he was delivered, that's, that's clear enough. God intervened. God acted on Daniel's behalf. God sent his angel to shut the lion's mouth. That's how he was delivered. It was a sovereign, divine intervention. But why was he delivered? Why did God show himself strong on Daniel's behalf? How he was delivered is clear enough. God sent his angel. But why was he delivered? Well, you say ultimately to bring glory to himself. And that's true. But why from the perspective of human responsibility? Well, did you notice that our passage actually tells us why? And it tells it gives us two reasons. And those two reasons are, uh, you know, where you where you're clued in to the reasons is when where you see the word because. And you see that word because two times. One of them in verse 22. My God sent his angel and has shut the lion's mouth so that they have not hurt me. Why? Because I was found innocent before him. And also, O king, I have done no wrong before you. So the first reason was Daniel's integrity. Both in his relationship to God and in his relationship to the king. Not again that Daniel was a sinless man, but he was a sincere and genuine man in his devotion to God, and in his service to the monarch. He was no hypocrite, pretending to be something he was not. But then we have a second reason given at the end of verse 23. Having acted in integrity, having acted in a good conscience in this situation, Daniel entrusted himself and his cause into the hands of God come what may. And at the end of verse 23, we read, And no injury, whatever was found on him, why? Here's the second reason. Because he believed in his God. Or it could be translated, because he had trusted in his God. Acting with integrity, with a good conscience toward God and toward man and what he had done, knowing that what he was doing was right, Daniel trusted in God. He left the outcome to God, knowing that if the Lord so willed, then not one lion could harm him. And if he did not so will, he knew and believed that God would do what is best in this case for his glory and for Daniel's good. Either way, Daniel could say with Paul, if the Lord be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death, I will rejoice. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. So what was said of Moses 
In Hebrews 11, it could be said of Daniel. By faith, he feared not the wrath of the king, but endured as seeing him who is invisible. And by that same faith, he chose rather to suffer affliction than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. And also, you may remember in Hebrews 11, and what I believe is probably a direct reference to this incident, we read, by faith, he stopped the mouths of lions. Hebrews eleven thirty three. So it was, on the one hand, his conscious integrity, coupled with his trust in God, that enabled Daniel to respond as he did to the trial, and that engaged the God of heaven on his behalf. That engaged the God of heaven to show himself strong on Daniel's behalf. Now, there's a lesson to be drawn from this for us who are God's people here this evening. And really, this is one of the major lessons uh, of this incident, but really of the entire six chapters of Daniel that we've covered. And that lesson is this, that those who in the midst of trial and temptation act in good conscience with trust in God may be confident that God will be with them. They may confidently expect the God of heaven to interpose on their behalf. Now, not always exactly the same way as he did with Daniel, but in the language of 1 Samuel 3, 2, 30 that we've gone back to numbers of times in this study, God will honor those who honor him. Now, again, he, he may not deliver you in the same way he did Daniel. He may not shut the lion's mouth. He may allow you to be devoured by the lions, as many Christian martyrs were in the Roman Colosseum. Yet the soul that acts in good conscience, that acts in obedience to God, and in faith commits himself and his cause into the hands of his heavenly Father, God will never leave that soul to be utterly destroyed. And ultimately, Christ will undertake to vindicate and to honor his faithful servants. He may not take you out of the lion's den right now, but he will be with you in it. You may remain in that den for a long time, but he will so preserve your soul that ultimately you'll not be harmed by it. Indeed, you'll, you'll gain more from it than you lose in it. For the lion's den will be turned by God to the promotion of your good. Daniel in the lion's den enjoyed much good. He enjoyed the good of a more experiential knowledge of God. A deeper communion with God through the ministry of his angel. Furthermore, the lion's den resulted in the good of presenting a powerful witness to unbelievers. And also, as we'll see, it was but the doorway to further usefulness in God's service. And even if the lions had devoured Daniel, his death would have been but his entrance into eternal glory, and his death would have been allowed by God only because God had determined that his earthly labors were now finished, and it was time for him to go home to be with the Lord, which is far, far better. And even in his death, his good testimony, his faithful witness would have remained behind as an encouragement to God's people and as a, a, a thorn in the consciences of God's enemies. And in one way or another, God would have turned it all to his glory and ultimately even to Daniel's glory on that great day when all wrongs will be made right and the righteous shall shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. And so the point is this, whatever trial or pressure you face that is tempting you to give in to compromise your commitment to Christ, to compromise obedience to God, to compromise righteousness, goodness, truth, justice, to compromise in some way, whatever that pressure is, you will never be found the loser if you put your trust in God and you do what is right. When you act in good conscience and in faith, committing yourself into God's hands, you have every reason to be full of confidence that God will interpose to turn everything that happens ultimately to your good and to his glory. Hebrews 13, 5 to 6, for he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. 
so that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man shall do to me. And that is the kind of boldness and confidence that every Christian ought to have and is warranted to have. And that's not pride. That's not arrogance because it's not based on, a, on an arrogant kind of con, uh, confidence in myself. But it's a confidence in God and in his promises to his people. The wicked flee when no man pursues, but the righteous are bold as a lion. Proverbs 28, 1. Full of confidence that God will not fail you nor forsake you. And those who honor him, he will honor. Well, we've considered the king's anxious inquiry, Daniel's declaration of his deliverance. Now let's consider thirdly the king's response to what has happened. It was a twofold response. Notice first of all in verse 24, he has Daniel's accusers thrown into the lion's den. And the king gave the command and they brought those men who had accused Daniel. And the implication is that Darius wasted no time in apprehending Daniel's accusers. These men have not only wronged Daniel, they have insulted him by using him to accomplish their hateful purpose. So the king commands that Daniel's accusers be brought forth and they cast them into the den of lions, them, their children, and their wives. This punishment of entire families, according to ancient historians, was a Persian custom and law. And the text goes on to say, And the lions overpowered them and broke all their bones in pieces before they ever came to the bottom of the den. What a gruesome picture. Now just try to imagine that. These men, their wives and all of their children are thrown into the den and they're completely devoured by those lions. And there's a you can see here, don't you, that there's, there's, a, there's a, a very evident irony here in all of this. Daniel's persecutors are consigned to the very fate that they intended for him. This is something we see often in Scripture. We see the same thing you may remember in the book of Esther. You remember Haman. He was hanged on the very gallows, and, and the scripture underscores this point, on the very gallows that he had prepared for Mordecai. And here we see illustrated a principle that is set forth in the Bible. For example, in Psalm 7, 15 and 16, the wicked are fallen into the pit which they have made for others. His trouble shall return upon his own head, and his violent dealing shall come down on his own crown. And again, we see this principle in Psalm 9, 15 to 16. The nations have sunk down in the pit that they made, in the net which they hid, their own foot is caught. The wicked is snared in the work of his own hands. But not only do we see an illustration of this principle... We also see in the dreadful punishment of these men a picture of what will eventually happen to all of the enemies of God. All of them. You may look at this picture and say, this is, this is so gruesome. But my dear friends, this is nothing compared to what's going to happen on the last day. Nothing in comparison. There is a day coming when all of the wicked will go into the den but it won't merely be the den of malice and persecution into which they have sought to cast the righteous, nor will it be a den from which they will emerge unharmed. It will be the den of the righteous wrath and indignation of a holy God, what the Bible calls the bottomless pit. They'll be cast into the bottomless pit where they will suffer the torments of the damned for all eternity. Brothers and sisters, we can get very discouraged when we look at the world around us. And it seems that all the craziness and wickedness is prevailing and winning the upper hand and gaining the field and winning the day. For brothers and sisters, wickedness and iniquity will not prevail on the earth forever. There is a day soon coming when Christ will judge the world in righteousness. And you see the contrast that's pictured for us in this narrative. God's faithful remnant remain. The wicked and unbelieving are destroyed. The remnant, God's true people, because of their faith. 
in their refusal to compromise with evil, they often find themselves in a den of lions, but the Lord is with them in it, and they emerge from their trials triumphant. The lost, on the other hand, are cast into the den of God's wrath, and when they go there, they will go alone, and they will not be delivered. No comforting presence of God with them, who will be punished with an everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord, 2 Thessalonians 1, 9, and God will never deliver them. Then they will call on me, but I will not answer. Because they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord, they would have none of my counsel and despise my every reproof. Therefore shall they eat the fruit of their own way and be filled to the full with their own fancies. Proverbs 1, 28 and following. What a difference there is between an unbeliever and a believer. Which category are you in tonight, my friend? Are you a child of the devil or a child of God? You know, there's not any in between. Did you know that? You're either one or the other. Are you a child of the devil or are you a child of God? Unbelieving or believing? Faithful or faithless? Living for this world or living for the world to come? Well, if it's this world you're living for, and if you refuse to repent and to be converted, then... And take note of what you see here in Daniel chapter 6. This is an awful description and picture of the destruction that is going to come upon all those who go on in their way in rebellion against Christ on the last day. It's a vague picture of the dreadful and eternal torment that awaits in hell. But not only did the king punish Daniel's accusers, secondly, he made a decree in honor of Daniel's God. Much like Nebuchadnezzar did back in chapter 4, Darius sends out a royal proclamation, verse 25, to all peoples, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth. The proclamation begins with the greetings, peace be multiplied to you, and then it contains a royal decree. I'll not open it up in detail, but let me just read it again. I make a decree, verse 26, that in every dominion of my kingdom, men must tremble in fear before the God of Daniel, for he is the living God and steadfast forever. His kingdom is the one which shall not be destroyed, and his dominion shall endure to the end. He delivers and rescues, and he works signs and wonders in heaven and on earth, who has delivered Daniel from the power of the lions. Now, without trying to determine Darius's true spiritual condition, I don't believe... I don't think there's enough information really here to do that. But whether he gave up his idols and was truly a changed man, we don't know for sure. But whether he was actually converted or not, one thing is very clear. Darius was awakened to the reality of the true and living God. And he wanted everyone to know about it in his kingdom. He was awakened to God's universal power and dominion, his faithfulness to his servants, he was caused to publicly confess God's supreme authority, and he calls all men to tremble and to fear before him. So by the experience of Daniel, God was highly magnified and glorified in this pagan kingdom by, to all those who observed these things, and especially to this pagan king. He was glorified throughout the empire. And then the chapter closes, and really, in fact, the entire narrative portion of the book of Daniel closes with these words. Verse 28, so this Daniel prospered in the reign of Darius and in the reign of Cyrus the Persian. Chapter 1, we see Daniel carried off as a captive to Babylon. As a young teenage boy, probably around 14 years old. The year was approximately 605 B.C. Daniel was therefore born sometime around 619 B.C. Seeing that Babylon fell to the Medes and Persians in 539 B.C., Daniel in this sixth chapter was somewhere now in the area of 80 years old. So he's been in Babylon. What's that? Don't let me mess up here. 66 years. Is that correct? No, he's been in Babylon 14 to 80. Right? Is that right, mathematicians over here? 66 years he's been in Babylon. And his years of service actually continued past this point, at least a little further, as we, we see in verse 28. On in through the reign of Cyrus the Persian, 
And we'll, we'll learn, we'll see one of the visions he's given later, I think, was during the third year of the reign of Cyrus the Persian. And what is most significant about this reference here is that it tells us that Daniel's life spanned the entirety of the Babylonian exile. Think about that. From the time of the fall of Jerusalem to Nebuchadnezzar to the time of Cyrus the Persian. And some of you may remember that it was Cyrus the Persian who issued the edict which allowed the Jews to return to their homeland and to rebuild the temple. That's an event that's recorded for us in the Old Testament book of Ezra chapter 1. Indeed, the Old Testament scholar and commentator Kyle argues that it may very well have been the influence of Daniel in the court of the king, that was one of the reasons that Cyrus had a favorable opinion of the Jews and had favor upon the Jews. And so we see, brothers and sisters, that in all that happened to Daniel, even from his youth to his old age and all the seeming tragedy being yanked away from his parents, yanked away from his homeland, carried off into this strange land of Babylon. And in all of the pressures that he faced there and all the trials that he endured there, that God was accomplishing his purposes for good for Daniel and for his people. And ultimately for the cause of the gospel in the preservation of those people who would be who would return uh, to their homeland, even as Jeremiah had prophesied that they would do after 70 years of captivity. Roman 8, Romans 8, 28 is not a cliche. It's solid truth to be counted on in our lives. All things work together for good to those who love God and are the called according to his purpose. And we certainly see that in the life of Daniel. Well, as we bring our study of the narrative of the life of Daniel to a climax, there are some final lessons that I want to underscore uh, before we go. First of all, I remind you again that here we see the truth of God's promise. Those who honor me, I will honor. Those who honor me, I will honor. This is one of the great lessons of the life of Daniel. And that ought to be a powerful and holy motivation to every child of God, to take a firm stand and to do what is right in our circumstances, no matter how great the pressure. When you find yourself faced with an intense moral dilemma, by pressurized circumstances like Daniel faced, when it could be so tempting to take the easy way out, remember God's promise. And remember Daniel. Remember these studies that we did on the book of Daniel, 2021. Remember them. Those who honor me, I will honor. And let that promise serve as a powerful incentive to solemnly resolve that come what may, you will not compromise. And there exists a lot in this world. A lot, much in the situations that some of us face. To make us fearful people. To make us persons who are wavering compromising, swept along with the crowd of our day down the broad way. And according to almost all appearances, the road ahead for the people of God in this country, in this our own Babylon, is going to be increasingly tough and difficult in the 21st century. Biblical principles, biblical standards of right and wrong Values, viewpoints, lifestyles that are a product of a Christian worldview, these things are quickly losing whatever favor and restraint upon society they once had. They're, they're, be, they're fading away. And God only knows what lies ahead. But to be honest, and to put it mildly, it doesn't look good, does it? And I don't think that's being a pessimist, I think that's a fact. That's reality. Now, I know that God could move and everything could be changed very quickly. I know and believe that God could very well do that. And we ought to earnestly pray to that end. But we must also be prepared in our hearts for what might happen. If God chooses to leave this nation to its perversion and its wickedness and revival never comes. And of course, whatever happens in the future of our nation... Even now, presently, in our personal context, we each face and we will face in various ways pressures like Daniel faced. And as we do, and I, I really have prayed, especially for you young people, 
as I prepared and preached these messages, that these that you would remember these messages. I, I don't know how long it's going to be before the Lord returns. It, it, may, it may be in our lifetimes, it may not. God may have for you a long life here in this world, and you're going to face all kinds of pressures. You're going to face all kinds of temptations. And I don't think it's going to be easy, and I think it's going to get worse. And my prayer is that God will bring to your mind those messages from the book of Daniel. You may not be able to remember my outlines, all the details, but you'll remember how the Spirit of God spoke to you in, in those messages in the book of Daniel, about the importance of staying true to him in Babylon. And the promise that those who honor me, I will honor. Remember that. Don't forget it. And then a second related lesson is this. There's no way to truly experience God's faithfulness to his promises, but by obedience. This is one reason why so many professing Christians are so lacking in any deep and intimate experiential acquaintance with God and His ways. And this is why they have so little experience of God's faithfulness. Why? Well, whenever things are really difficult and the pressure is on, whenever it might really cost them something to do what they know is right, they dodge the cross. They compromise to try to weasel out of it, and therefore they miss the opportunity of seeing God move on their behalf. And even a true Christian can be guilty of this sometimes. My friend, my word to you, if you find yourself even now in a moral dilemma, or when you do in the future, and you're tempted to take the easy way out, my word to you again is remember Daniel. Obey God, come what may, and learn experientially. No, not just from Daniel's experience, but from your own personal experience. That one way or another, God does honor those who honor him. It's one thing to, be, to quote that verse. It's one thing to know it intellectually and theoretically, but it's another thing to know it experientially and to know God as a faithful God to his children experientially. To be able to say, I know it's true. I know it's true because I found it so. Because I found it so in my own life. Can you say that this evening? Well, there's only one way to be able to say that and to find it to be so more and more as your life goes on. And it's in the same way Daniel did and all of the saints of God have in the Bible throughout history. It's by obeying God. Obeying God in everything, whatever the cost, regardless of whatever reasons the flesh and human reason might give to the contrary, is by walking by faith in your Babylon. Not a faith that consists merely of talk, but a faith that determines to obey when everything is dark and when obedience would seem to lead to nothing but disaster. And then thirdly, and finally, the third lesson, Daniel's long life of usefulness in Babylon is a testimony to the fact that God always has a faithful remnant. That ought to be an encouragement to us. Daniel lived during a very dark period in the history of God's people. The exile was the result of God's judgment against the religious apostasy of the nation of Judah. But even in this dark hour, God had a faithful remnant. Apparently, uh, there have been debates about how many Jews who were carried off to Babylon were truly godly people. It was certainly only a few of them. And then there's the question of how many stayed true to God after they got there. Well, exact numbers obviously can't be given, but one thing that can be dogmatically asserted from what what we're told in other places is that it was a small minority. But that small minority, which included Daniel, is a testimony to the fact that God always has a faithful remnant, even in the darkest days. He always reserves to himself at least a remnant in the darkest times of Old Testament history, And in the history of the New Covenant Church, he's always had a remnant. Sometimes things have been very bad. If you study church history, things have been very, very bad. 
In true religion, true, genuine, vital, experiential Christianity has been very hard to find. And it's becoming that way today, isn't it? But there's always at least a remnant. As Jesus said, I will build my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. In the language of our confession, chapter 26, paragraph 3, Christ always hath had and ever shall have a kingdom in this world. The Nebuchadnezzars and Belshazzars and the Dariuses of this world may try to stamp it out. Vast portions of the professing church might fall into apostasy and become so degenerate as to be no churches of Christ at all, but synagogues of Satan. The allurements and attractions and pressures of Babylon might swallow up and overcome the great majority of those who once profess to be God's people. And because iniquity abounds, the love of many may wax cold. But God will always have a faithful remnant. And my dear people, this is not merely a theoretical truth. There are parallels in the situation that we find ourselves in today, in this Babylon of the United States of America. And it may be even more the case in the years to come. But whatever happens, whatever happens, don't lose heart. Let us take comfort. We should never fear that true religion will ever vanish from the earth. Or that, will ever ultimately, that Christ will ever ultimately be defeated because he will not. He will not be defeated. He will build his church. The gates of hell will not prevail against it. And now as I close this study, let me turn our eyes away from Daniel to him. The one that is greater than Daniel, the God-man Jesus Christ. He too had enemies who sought to destroy him, but they could find nothing against him except touching his God. They accused him of blasphemy. And then afterwards they brought a charge of sedition against the state as they did with Daniel. But he continued steadfast in obedience to the Father. He was obedient unto death, even the death of the cross, where he died to redeem his people from their sins. He was cast into the den, into the grave. His soul, as it were, as we read in Psalm 22, was among the lions. It seemed as though all hope was gone. But the day of vindication came. Those who honor me, I will honor God raised him from the dead. And now he is exalted to the right hand of the majesty on high. To all of his enemies and ours are made his footstool. Thank God for our great Daniel, the one greater than Daniel, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by his death and his resurrection delivers all those who put their trust in him from the dominion of sin, death, and hell. And he has also promised... To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am sat down with my father in his throne. Well, may God help us to do so. Let's pray together. Our father, we thank you for the life of Daniel. What a blessing it has been to us in these past months. How timely it has been. We do pray that the principles and truths that we have repeatedly heard over these months would be deeply riveted to our hearts and that they will guide us in the days and months and years to come, however long we still have upon this earth. Help us to be faithful to you. Whatever happens, come what may. Help us to be faithful to you in the small ways, in the little ways, in our families, in our places of work, in the, the trials that we all endure day by day, the temptations that come upon us. Help us, Lord, by your grace, to follow the example of Daniel, to follow the example of our Savior, the Lord Jesus. And we pray that you'd give us grace to persevere and to be faithful to you all the way to the very end even as Daniel was, even as our Savior was. We are dependent upon your spirit and your grace to help us. We cry to you for that grace. 
We trust you for it. And we long for that day, Lord, when evil and perversion and wickedness will be removed from the earth. And the meek shall inherit the earth. And the will of God will be done on earth as it is done in heaven. Even so, Lord, come quickly. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen.